Um, so we're going to move now on to um, Wilding Pines. And three years ago when I became Director General, one of the first things I did put on the table with ministers was my fear that Wilding Pines was going to be a huge issue for New Zealand. And um, Keith Bryden gave me all the data I needed, and I guess it was Minister Barry who um, listened really, at, you know, it was an instant, yes, this is a big issue for New Zealand. So for two years we were building the case for Wilding Pines and Keith gave me much of the information to make ministers aware of how significant this issue is in terms of a game changer of our landscapes, in terms of what it could do to the country and again fascinating to see the groups of people out there dealing to Wilding Pines now. So ladies and gentlemen, Keith Bryden who actually also sits on the governance group because the government did give us 16 million and it's administered through MPI, but it, we are linked at the hip, much as we are doing with Myrtle Rust on this issue too. Keith, Keith Brighton. Kia ora and welcome to my presentation. My presentation will basically flow through four points. I'll quickly introduce the war on weeds. I'll then outline the wild and conifer threat in New Zealand. I'll then show some examples of the impact on threatened species, which are a really serious issue. And then I'll tell you something about the control efforts, what we're doing about the wilding conifers and, and winning against wildings. OK, the War of Weeds was announced by the Minister of Conservation and Honourable Maggie Barry in 2015. And the aim of that is to help focus our communities to do some weed work or increase the amount of weed work they do. We have about 350 weeds that affect ecosystems or threatened species. So what we do is we try and focus the community on 12 a year. We call that the dirty dozen. In 2017, enemy number one on the dirty dozen was wilding conifers. So wilding conifers are the self-seeded conifers, we've got lots of conifers, that are self-seeded from uh, conifers that were planted for some other purpose and are the wrong, they become the wrong tree in the wrong place. So there's about 10 species of wild and conifers that we have a particular interest in, um, in in our environment and species programs. So I'll just go over the attributes of two of them. Uh, the worst one is contorta pine. Um, it starts seeding at about age six, and when it matures, it can have about 17,000 seeds. Those seeds can go up to 20 kilometres in the wind. Uh, originally, it was planted for high country planting, shelter belts, and even a few woodlots where radiata wouldn't grow. Uh, but as you can see on the right-hand side there, um, the timber is pretty useless. It's not very good for anything. Where it comes from in North America, it grows to an altitude of 3,500 metres, so Mount Cook, Hauraki, is about 3,700. So it's quite capable of taking over our alpine and subalpine vegetation, apart from all, uh, a number of areas lower down as well, tussock country. It's an unwanted organism under the Biosecurity Act. <clears throat> the second one I'll just go over is one called Douglas fir. This has rapidly risen to be our, what is, appears to be our second worst wild and conifer species. So the seeds from this one can travel 40 kilometres. We've found seedlings 40 kilometres from the nearest planted um, ones. They don't seed till about age 12 or 13, so that's a bonus. The difference between Douglas fir and the conifers is Douglas fir is more shade tolerant and will grow in a lot more ecosystems. So we're finding it in braided riverbeds, shrublands, wetlands, and even in under beach canopy, beach forest canopy. Uh, the pictures here, first of all, uh, that is one of volunteers removing Douglas fir up near Lake Rotowiti. And the second one, if you've been to Queenstown, you go up through the gondola through those nice Douglas fir stands. These are the wildings at the back of uh, Queenstown. These are Douglas fir. So a particular challenge with Douglas fir, of course, is it's also a commercial species and it's also one of the preferred species for um, capturing carbon. So there's quite a few challenges on, on working with the seed sources and, and working with the wildings of this one. 
Again, in North America, this one grows to about 3,000 metres, so again, it's quite capable of, of going right up into our alpine and subalpine vegetations. Okay, so this graph here is um, wild and conifers are increasing in area, growing older and getting bigger. So the graph starts about 1930 and goes through to about 2015. <clears throat> and what we see over that period is we first started noting wild and conifers about the 1930s, and they've been spreading at 6% per year compounding till we get to about 90, uh, 2015, we were actually adding about 90,000 hectares a year of an uh, affected area, which is the size of about one and a half Kaweka forest parks. So most of it is light infestation or sparse infestation, medium and dense, but what we find is as the trees get older, the sparse infestation becomes medium and the medium becomes dense. So we're ending up with bigger areas of medium and dense forest and adding a lot of new if, uh, lightly infected areas. <clears throat> so if you control them when it's sparse, it can be between sort of $1 and $10 a hectare, so it's quite cheap. If you procrastinate, we call this the, the cost of procrastination. If you wait till it's dense, it will cost you $2,000 a hectare to early spray it, or if you have to use manual chainsaw methods, it can cost up to $10,000 a hectare. So it makes good sense to control it when it's cheap and easy and hasn't had much impact. If nothing happened, and, and remember that this spread is with the existing budget of about $11 million a year. So we keep adding money, but they're actually growing faster than we add the money. So if we did nothing, within 20 years, around 20 or 25% of New Zealand would be affected in some way by wild and conifers. So that's a nice graph, but what does it look like on the ground? This is a site in Southland, and again, you can see the light infestation, medium infestation, and dense infestation, and that took 17 years. So recently, we had Wildlands Consultant look at all the land cover classes in New Zealand and the vulnerability of wild and conifers. And the reds and purples on this are the most vulnerable classes, so Central North Island and most of the dry eastern South Island. But there's also other areas as well. There's sand dune countries and cliffs, and, and um, you know, it's quite a few areas that will be affected by wild and conifers. But basically, if we didn't deal with wild and conifers, about 50% of New Zealand land cover would become some sort of a conifer forest. So now moving on to well, what, is, what has this got to do with threatened species? So I'll use the examples of New Zealand's naturally rare ecosystems. So we have a number of naturally rare ecosystems. We've got geothermal, ultramafic, glacial outwash, um, frost flats, and um, inland sand dune systems, is, is, and cliffs and bits and pieces. And these, many of these natural ecosystems or naturally rare ecosystems are fairly harsh sites, fairly disturbed sites, and they're absolutely ideal for wild and conifer invasion. So we have two here. These are the inland sand dunes in the central North Island. And this one here is the frost flats in the central North Island. And you can see that wild and conifers would, would um, completely take over these ecosystems. So just honing in a wee bit um, to the Mackenzie country, uh, this is an area that's a national stronghold for nationally rare ecosystems. And that provides habitat for numerous rare and threatened species. The Mackenzie already has 24% affected by wild and conifers, so, and, and it's expanding. So here are some of the, I'll just go through three or four slides of some of the rare ecosystems and the species. So here we have um, some threatened and rare plants, some more th threatened and rare plants. Of course we have some birds such as the black stilt and the rybill. And we have a range of invertebrates including the robust grasshopper and several others. 
So if you have a look at those open ecosystems and then think that Mackenzie country, country is headed for a wild and conifer forest, it's hard to imagine that these species are going to persist in a wild and conifer monoculture. I've also put a slide up on the impacts of water from wild and conifers. So wild and conifers impact on water yield and water quality. So in this particular study, there was a catchment went from native tussock to a conifer forest, and in 22 years, the water yield reduced 42%. If you reduce the water yield and you have the same amount of contaminants going in your water, you also reduce the water quality. So less water, poorer water quality has an impact on the threatened freshwater species. Okay, the way forward, what are we doing about it? First of all, we have a strategy which was finished in 2015 and that's a recipe for New Zealand to deal with the wild and conifer problem but we also needed some new funding. In budget 2016, uh, we got an extra $16 million over four years. We also got some additional research money and we've also put some money into the community conservation funding for wild and conifer, so community groups can do wild and conifer work. So now we come to the crazy and ambitious part, seen as it's a crazy and ambitious conference. With the $16 million over four years, in the first year, we decided to spend $5 million in year one and control a million hectares of wild and conifers. So from Southland all the way up through Otago, Canterbury, Molesworth, and the central North Island. So how have we done? I think on Friday, the minister announced that we'd just about got to the million hectares and we've still got three months to go in the financial year. So we're going to spend the money and we're going to probably do more than a million hectares, so it's a, a relatively cheap and, and uh, very achievable um, intervention. So most of the work has been done through aerial wanding, so we're, we're really trying to bring in those scattered and sparse ones so they don't grow and become expensive to control. So a lot of it's done by the air, um, individual plants and, and getting rid of very small seed sources. And of course, quite a bit of it's ground control, so aerial and ground control. So that's what we've done in year one, and we're just at the planning stage for what we're going to do in year two. So in summary, we have a war on weeds. Wild and conifers are public enemy number one. Wild and conifer spread is a serious New Zealand issue. Wild and conifers have serious impacts on your threatened species programs if we do nothing about them. And with a good strategy and some funding, we can win against wildings. Thank you. <laughs>